I am so excited to get started on our Lunch and Learn today. We are here to talk about innovation storytelling. So how can we go about telling stories in an innovative way that just allows us to build a stronger mentor bond between us and our mentoring relationship? How can we tell stickier, how can we have stickier conversations so then people are remembering what we said last time? And the reason why we're remember, remembering it is because we told really great stories. I've got an awesome guest with us today. Susan Lindner is, is amazing. She's a cultural anthropologist. She's a brand marketer and a disruptor. Susan got her start as an AIDS educator in brothels in Thailand, where she helped prostitutes turn into entrepreneurs. Today, she is the founder of Emerging Media, where she helps innovators and disruptors create the stories that get them resources, recognition, and runway. Needless to say, Susan is the expert storytelling person. So Susan, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Garrett. So what is innovation storytelling? Or rather, what is the difference between normal storytelling and innovation storytelling? Yeah, so you know, you may remember uh, stories you know that your grandmother and, and your mom used to tuck you in with at night you know the once upon a time and those are fantastic um, oftentimes they begin with great characters lots of emotion lots of drama and typically conclude with a with a happy ending um, innovation storytelling is about getting people to see a yet unseen future and it awfully come often comes on the heels of a new technology uh, a new process or a new service that's being introduced that allows us to see things differently. It's like what happened on one side of the iPhone and the other. What happened on one side of email and the other. Uh, the difference between ordering food, you know, going to the supermarket and getting food or ordering food online. Our experience shifts. And in order for us as humans to really understand that process and dive in with both feet, we need a story to get us there. It is the bridge between strategy and market adoption. And I, it, I think that this could also apply for not groundbreaking innovations. I think this could apply. I know we have a lot of mentoring relationships where we set up and there are two department heads mentoring each other. Yeah. Or someone in one department compared with someone else in a different department. And they've come up with something that maybe shaves off a few minutes, makes things a little more efficient around the office or like, here's a new process and procedure we want to throw in place as opposed to it being a, because I said so process and procedure, how can we go about telling stories about why we should all be implementing this new process and procedure that we might've identified through our mentoring relationship? Yeah. So if you're the, if you're the gal who's had this incredible experience of implementing something that shaved off that time, don't tell them how you do it. Tell them a story of someone who did it and what that outcome was like. What happened to, you know, Bob in procurement and Anita in accounting and you know, Josephine back in HR. Tell us what happened to them with this new policy or this new process or product that you're implementing, rather than saying, we bought Salesforce, we got 40% of our people on board, we got um, people really using and uploading the, you know, using the product and the adoption rate was fantastic and now sales are up 40%. There is nothing about that description that makes me connect. As opposed to, let me tell you the story of Tony. He was an absolute failure as a salesperson. He could not connect because no matter what system we put in front of him, he wouldn't use it. He was a maverick. He got great relationships with customers, but boy, trying to hold him to figure out his sales reports and getting his figures in on time was awful. We put Salesforce in front of him and let me tell you, this guy changed overnight. So Tony is sitting here inputting his data. He's talking to 20 times more customers in a day and his numbers are through the roof. Tony is like the biggest evangelist now for Salesforce. You can't shut up about it. It's kind of driving me crazy. But Tony is like going to be employee of the year. He actually saved our quarter. You'll never I forget Tony. Remember yeah, you'll never forget Tony and what a screw up he was and what a superstar he became, right? So telling the story, even in that mentoring relationship, allows you to go, now let me tell you about the relationship we have with our sales guy at Salesforce, right? Now I can tell you about the deal, how much we pay, how many users we have. And now your brain is primed to receive and retain all of that. And if I'm a really good storyteller, I can even say what the future of my department's going to look like two, three quarters from now. 
that get people excited and inspired to move and take action. Because that's what innovation storytelling should do is allow people to make the jump into the future without fear. I love that. And that's really fascinating. Um, because I feel like I've spoken with some uh, professionals that are that are in mentoring relationships. And sometimes I'll say, I, I can imagine that they might be thinking to themselves like, well, I'm a facts and figures kind of person. I only want to know facts and figures. That's really what makes and drives my decisions. I think you told me this before. What was the fact that you, what was the percentage uh, that you said about people citing percentages versus telling stories and their ability to be remembered over time? That's right. It's a fantastic study that's done by Stanford. And I'm going to ask you to remember a statistic. <laughs> so the human brain is 22 times more likely to remember all those critical statistics and numbers when it is wrapped in story. When we focus all of our time and attention just on the numbers, they leave our brain. How many times do you read an article in the newspaper and then go, wow, 76% of people are suffering from, wait, was it 33%? Was it 28%? Was it 95%? How many of us are capable at a cocktail party of recalling that number that we saw, you know, that we read about in the paper? Or if we just got a bulletin from our boss with just three bullets, how likely are we to remember those statistics? Well, the Stanford study told us six minutes later, we've already since forgotten them. And so the question as a leader is, and even as a mentor, do you want to be effective or not? And that's why storytelling matters, because it allows numbers to stick to our very ancient brain. I love that. And I think that probably also is very much relevant to organizational behavioral change. Because even if I am a person who thinks I'm a facts and figures kind of person, I only move on facts and figures. Um, even when the data and the facts and figures indicate that stories are more popular, or sorry, stories are more powerful, um, it still might be difficult for them to grasp this. But I want to almost think about it from an organizational change standpoint. If we're able to start telling stories to our colleagues, to our peers, to the people that we work with, is that an effective tool for providing and amplifying and, and a catalyst, being a catalyst for change within our business and, and driving our business forward? I would argue it's the only way. The only way that you get people behind you is for them to rally around an idea. Now, if people can't remember the idea, they can't share it with their fellow human at work. <laughs> they can't broadcast it to other people and put it on your intranet or your internal social media pages um, or share it in a meeting over and over again to get people on board. How will organizational change ever take place if the human brain can't recall what you've asked them to remember? So that story is the way that people, A, repeat a story, but more important even than that, is that they make it their own. They take it into their heart and they actually change your story and make it their own. So that same story about Tony, what is the story Tony is telling? What is the story that Tony's coworker is now telling? How are they experiencing that software and going, I want a piece of that. I want to do what Tony's doing. I tried it and here's what happened to me. I was the number one performing person in my department. I've doubled my numbers. I was too afraid to ask for help with the last software deployment, but this is so easy. Anybody can do it. Now I'm teaching it to Jan sitting next to me, right? So the ability for us to hear a story, take in a story, make it our own and change it, and now push it out to other people, that is how organizational change takes place. That is how culture moves. We make it our own. If we don't buy in, nothing's moving. And if we can't remember it, even less. That's fascinating. And that is very much in line. I'm, just, I'm in the middle of reading this book called Creativity, Inc. It's by a guy named Ed Catmull, the guy that started Pixar. And I just finished the chapter about essentially appeasing the machine. And by the machine, I mean the overall thing moving the business forward. And sometimes that can make people make decisions that are not better for the business, but better for their own personal agenda. So when Ed's talking about making a new movie, whether it be Finding Nemo or Monsters, Inc. or anything like that, you've got the marketing team who's thinking like, okay, are we creating characters that we can then sell products for that you know will help us generate revenue for the, the future of our business? You've got the um, the actual storytellers who are saying like, hey, are we telling a story that's true to ourselves 
or is this trying to be, you know, something that's more commercially driven? We've got the accounting that's like saying, hey, we need to, you know, keep this within budget. We can't be spending so much money on production because if we do, we're going to run out of cash. soon. you've got all these different competing voices. We're all in our own respective departments competing for, you know, trying to do our job the best we possibly can do. I feel like that's where stories could come in and be really powerful because ultimately, as opposed to saying, hey, my personal agenda needs to win out. If we create a story about why if this thing happens, we're able to help your story win, my story win, their story win, and their story win. And that makes everybody rally around this one outcome or opportunity that can exist and happen. That's right. That's right. That's so powerful, Garrett, because then you have people sharing stories back and forth with each other. And it's the story allows us to open up and hear other stories. When we tell a story, if we're smart, we'll stop for a second and say, I'm going to be quiet now. I'd like to hear yours. How did this change you? How do you see this? Let me see it through your lens. Because that's when stories get richer. I mean, I always, when I speak, I always use examples of the greatest viral storytellers ever. Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Moses, right? We're still telling these stories in some cases 5,000 years later. We're still telling these stories. Our storyteller has long since passed on, probably to a far better place. <laughs> but that, that we keep telling these stories, we tell their story, but we've made those stories our own. And we are open to hearing how this revelation, whatever it may be, impacted us personally. Then we give our own testimony and we share it again. And suddenly the story is reborn and told anew. And that's why we can still watch Disney movies over and over again. And we love telling those stories because they hit our hearts in our own lives. So much so that I named my cats Dory and Nemo. Those stories will never leave us. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. So let's talk about mentorship for a moment, because I think we've given a lot of examples about how we can implement innovative story, innovation storytelling in our work environment. But in a mentoring relationship, how can we go about ensuring that we're telling stories that are, are really capturing us? Because I know that one thing that we discuss often with our horizontal mentoring relationships is this notion of how we view our work. Some people view, our, view their work as a job. Some people view their work as a career. Some people view their work as a calling. We try to structure our meeting agendas based on that. So we know that people who are job-oriented get the majority of their workplace engagement socially. So we know that going out and grabbing a lunch together is a great way for them to go about having a mentor meeting and, and talking about things about how can their work allow them to live the life they want to live outside of work. Or if we're career oriented, we're motivated by professional growth. So is there a skill that we can learn that help us can help us amplify our abilities at work? Or if we're calling oriented, is there a story about not only how does our work impact our department, but our company as a whole, or even our community? How does our puzzle piece fit into the jigsaw puzzle of our entire just working mindset. So how can stories play a role in helping us build stronger mentoring bonds with each other? Yeah. Well, you know, I think as leaders, uh, we might want to think about what are the kinds of employees that we are attracting? Are we attracting job-oriented, career-oriented, or purpose-oriented employees? And then creating those mentoring opportunities where they strongly exist. I know um, in speaking about storytelling for employee engagement, Research found that Patagonia allows its employees to um, protest on behalf of the earth and get paid for that time. They can catch a wave in the middle of their day and take that as uh, paid time off. Uh, they can go and start a vegetable garden on the roof of the Patagonia headquarters if they're so inclined. So all of those things allow us to interact with one another. And then those stories for those purpose-driven companies allow us to come back and talk about them. Um, I think within the mentoring relationship, we're actually helping one another is bringing us closer to those individual callings. So Garrett, do you find that the job oriented mentor relationship is sometimes among younger employees who see themselves just getting in and don't know if there's a career or a purpose, or is this really transgenerational? Transgenerational. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the fascinating thing about it is that it really, it, it, and it, it really can, I, can all depend, and it's fluid, so it changes throughout your life. So you can be job-oriented at one point in time and then change to a different point. You could have been not job-oriented and then become more job-oriented. I mean, I've, I've seen this in an example where 
I've seen a young person who graduated college and she was like, I want to work for nonprofits. I want to be changing the world, very calling oriented. And then I don't know, they got a little bit burnt out. They just, they kept working for this nonprofit. They weren't making the kind, they weren't earning the kind of funds that they wanted to earn to live the life they wanted to live outside of work. Their passion towards the outcome that they wanted to have kind of subsided and they ended up pursuing work that was a little bit more job oriented where they could have that balance. So then they could say, Hey, I'm working this, this, this work. And, and this is allows me to achieve the balance that I want to live outside of work. And then when I'm on the weekends, maybe I can do some of that nonprofit volunteering opportunity, but I can ultimately have the kind of work that, that ultimately makes me fulfilled um, in both parts. And the job is just as fine. And we also found that there's not a correlation between being more or less engaged at work based on your work orientation. So people who are job oriented are just as engaged as people who are career oriented and people who are career oriented are just as engaged as people who are calling oriented. So it's not, there's not a right or wrong work orientation and it can change, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fluid. I guess the point I'm making is that there's, it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing to be in one work orientation or another. Um, but it's important that we're connecting and relating to other people that have similar work orientations to us. Yeah. So Perhaps knowing that, right, about the person that you're in a mentoring relationship with is going, oh, I'm really in it for the purpose. I'm really in it for the job. There's ways to learn from one another too, right, that we can, um, that we can get teamed up and we can really begin to figure out the stories that connect us even across those purposes, Right. And How do we do that? I love to know, like those those stories that help us connect our backgrounds. I think that's where we get into like the meat of a strong mentoring relationship. How can we go about inspiring others, our mentor, to share that story with us? And how can we go about feeling comfortable with being vulnerable to opening up that to them? Right, because it may feel like, well, I'm here to climb the corporate ladder. I want to get as far and as fast and as rich as possible while I'm here in the company. And someone would say. I'm just here because I really believe in the mission, right? So you may find, and to some people that might sound like a conflict, but to other people, I think there might be a richness and understanding that both of those reasons are valid. So in that kind of relationship, I would ask both to, you know, come with an empathetic heart to A, listen to one another, because I think the opportunity here is for incredible inspiration. You know, who knew that I could be here for the purpose, but I could also make a mint doing it. Or I could also help tons of customers in the process. Or I could also find my way up the ladder so that more people would experience the purpose. Maybe they thought they were just coming here for a career-oriented opportunity, but there's more satisfaction to be had. And I think the opportunity in the storytelling is allow people to benefit from the richness of both sides of that. And probably that career-oriented person could learn to become, not just be in it necessarily for themselves as they rise, but recognize maybe they're connecting to a deeper purpose and can inspire people uh, below them on, on that rise up to become more um, mission-oriented. And I say that because even that person who's inspired to rise quickly up the corporate ladder is still going to be judged on the team's around her. So if our teams aren't performing at a high level and aren't engaged and oriented perhaps around that mission or an opportunity to climb sincerely the same way, without storytelling around those particular attributes, the team probably won't succeed because they all have different motivators for being at work too. That makes sense. So how can we tell better stories? How can I go about being more intentional about telling a better story? Because I think maybe if I'm not used to telling stories all the time, or if this is not something I am accustomed to doing frequently, I might think to myself, well, I'm not a great storyteller, or I haven't, I guess, really practiced doing it that much. One, how can be how can I be more comfortable with failing <laughs> or at least attempting to put out my first story and you know maybe it not going off as well as I would have liked um, but to be, be feel comfortable to keep practicing because I know that's a really important skill to build um, and two how can I become better how can I know if I'm making progress oh these are such great questions okay so if you're brave and you want to tell the story about yourself right think about the biggest mistake you made at work. That's the big vulnerability. That's terrifying. Now, if that sounds too crazy, right? And you're like, 
sure, I could tell that story, but I'd probably get fired the next day if anyone ever found out about my giant mistake. Think about what's next after that. That thing that gives you pause, that thing that just gives you a break, or even if you don't want to tell your biggest vulnerability, what about my best day at work? Now, the best day at work story usually sounds like I had this awesome conversation with a customer. I was able to close them within 48 hours. They absolutely love the product, and now they've been a customer for life. I've never met a salesperson for whom that's happened, ever. <laughs> and so it's time to just get a little bit more honest about the details that went into that. I was late for work. I spilled coffee all over my pants. I was never going to make it to that sales meeting on time if I was going to have this call with my prospective client. I had to tell my boss to put the brakes on. I had to put away my fear of picking up the phone and calling that prospect. I had to decide whether or not I was going to push for the biggest software package as opposed to the lowest $9.99 a month option. I had to ask whether or not they needed any help in convincing their boss to make it happen because while it was fine on my side, my guy was in a make or break moment. So think about all the different pieces of the story that allow you to go, huh, this is where the challenge was. This is where the tough parts was. Even in a great story, without some fear of failure, we don't connect. Who cares whether or not you close the biggest deal ever if there is no drama leading up to it? So step one is step back for a moment and examine the pieces of the story. What's the beginning, middle, and end? Number two, who's our person? Is it you? Is it your friend, Tony? Is it someone else that we can draw into the story if talking about yourself feels way too vulnerable? Number three, where's the drama? But more importantly, what's the takeaway? What's the thing that moves them that says, yes, that happened to me? Yes, that feels similar to something. That might happen to me in the future. Now I'll know what to do. And that when you finish telling the story, be quiet. Allow people to ask questions. Allow people to give you feedback. Be open to them saying, I didn't really follow that. Why was that so powerful? What happened at the end there? What's coming next now? So be prepared to be open to getting a little bit of critique on your story. That's a really good perspective. I really like that. Um, I think that is something that is like the most fearful part of any person about to tell a story is the critique is the, how will other people think about me after I share this story? How can you overcome that fear? Uh, record it on your phone, make a video of yourself telling the story, give yourself a three minute time window, right? Don't make it too hard on yourself. The first time tell your story for three minutes into your phone and then the dreaded playback. No one likes to hear their own voice on the phone, <laughs> but do it. This is the way we all get better. Garrett, you probably don't know this about me, but I do stand-up comedy on the weekends just to terrify myself. And the worst part of stepping off the stage, forget about getting crickets while you're up there performing, <laughs> but is going back and listening to the recording of every performance to hear where people laughed and where they didn't. And that is the reckoning moment. But recording that story, and if you have a mentor relationship with someone, could you hit send on that story and go, what do you think? Your mentor relationship is a place where you can play, is a place where you can be free if you trust one another to say, take a listen to the story. I was going to open the sales meeting next week talking about this. I was going to open our team stand-up, right, and our software development. I was going to start off by talking about, like, the greatest coding failure I ever had. Can I share this with you? Just that little recording will make you go, just getting it out of your inbox will make you go, oh, you'll be surprised. You know what? I think that makes a lot of sense. The idea of putting out your fears and, you know, it's interesting. So it makes me think of something that I did. I, I one time went through this program called, called Unleash the Power Within. It's through a guy named Tony Robbins. Um, and Tony Robbins, who's that? <laughs> Tony Robbins is a motivational speaker and he's extremely, he's got really great insight, really great wisdom. Um, and he, one thing that he had everybody in the audience, and I'm talking about an audience of like 7,000 people, is he had everybody write down their greatest fear. And then what he did was he had everybody turn to each other, stick their fingers into their nose, like literally into their nose and say that fear out loud. And the idea behind it is it's, I believe it's neuro-linguistic programming 
when we associate a ridiculous action with a ridiculous thought and we put it out there into the world, our ability to overcome that fear is so much greater. And so by your advice of having people record that story, record that fear into their phone, play it back, by putting it out into the ether, our ability to overcome and realize that's not that big of a deal. Like, okay, you know what? No one's going to fire me because I shared this story. I'm going to be embraced. This is going to be okay. And I might learn something from this. And I might empower somebody else to feel comfortable sharing their story. That's right. That's right. And that is what story does. Ask Oprah, right? By creating a platform for 25 years where people share their stories, other people were finally able to share their own, get help that they needed, see their life in a new way, look for transformation. That is how the human brain is worked. You tell a story, you open the opportunity for someone else to tell theirs. That is the reciprocal, magnetic, incredible, irresistible power of story. Yeah, and I love, I love your great, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, we talked about this idea of don't should on anybody. Oh. And by that, you mean, don't say, you know what, after hearing somebody else's story, the worst thing you could possibly say is, well, after hearing that, you should do this. The should, don't should on anybody, or if I were you, I would do this. That is the worst, because ultimately it makes you seem like you're better than they are, and it does not empathize or relate to who they are as a person and what they just put out there to you. Uh, and so what you could do instead is you can ask questions. You can try to seek to understand them before being understood about maybe where you stand on the topic, because ultimately it might be different, and that's okay. But by asking those questions of like, hey, Thank you so much for sharing this story with me. Do you mind elaborating a little bit on this one part? I was a little confused about that. Or, you know, have you considered doing this? That's a better way of providing advice without actually saying you should do this. What do you think? Absolutely. And so when you give that story, you know, ask your mentor to send you back a story, right? This could be a story swap, a great activity between two horizontal mentors to share their stories because you're just going to get deeper and deeper and deeper with your mentor in this relationship when you start sharing and know that there is no boundary. You know, you, the other thing that you can do is give yourself a four minute writing prompt. Say, I'm going to write down my story in four minutes and I'm going to stop and see where you land and do this. I have a writing partner. I do this every morning at 8 a.m. with my writing partner. We give ourselves a theme. We write a story, four minutes, stop, share. Good, hey, better, you, Are you all right with like abbreviating it? Could you just do the bullet points of the story? You don't have to go to the nitty gritty details, just kind of like this, this is where I was. This is kind of what, how I felt. This is what happened next. Is that how you're kind of subscribing to this? Because I think that's Absolutely. a great idea. Absolutely. And then when you do it with one another, your response back to that person, I really loved. I would have loved more information here. Is it possible to expand this? That is so curious. What else can you tell me about that? Find out where like those nooks and crannies are, you know, that the butter really lands in and you just want to take the next bite of the English muffin. Like where is it where people are hanging on the stuff that you're creating for them? That's a really good point. All right. Well, Susan, this has been good. This has been awesome. I've really enjoyed learning more about innovation storytelling and how we can be more intentional about telling stories in our mentoring relationships as well as in our professional lives. How can our audience connect with you? How can they learn about what you are doing next? Um, so then they can maybe connect with you if they like to learn more. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm really excited. My book, Innovation Storytelling, Get the Resources, Runway, and Recognition You Deserve is coming out in August. If you're interested in pre-ordering, by all means, go to susanlinder.com and we can hook you up there. If you'd like some help in creating your own innovation story, book a time with me for free, 30 minutes, schedulesusan.com. Um, and I'd be happy to help you work on your own innovation story and just to learn more about you. And I also give keynote speeches, workshops, uh, consulting, and one-on-one -on -one coaching to people who are in the midst of creating their own stories. Um, and you can find about all of that on SusanLender.com. That's awesome. This has been great, Susan. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for being here. I look forward to seeing you all in our next Lunch and Learn. Thanks, Garrett. Keep telling those stories. <laughs>